Good afternoon. Welcome to the Great Consolidation. This is the Entertainment Weekly Migration Case Study. So uh, this is a co-presentation across two different organizations. Uh, my name is John Peck. I'm a senior engineer at Four Kitchens. I'm joined by Matt Grill, who's an engineer at Four Kitchens, and Preston So from Time Incorporated. He's the tech lead of Entertainment Weekly. So what did we do and who did it? So Entertainment Weekly is an uh, entertainment news magazine. Uh, it's a print magazine that's been around for quite a while. It's uh, the 40th largest magazine in the United States. Uh, EW.com serves 13.7 million consumers per week. Uh, this is across a variety of devices, uh, and uh, these numbers are a few months old. It's probably a bit bigger now. Um, there's uh, a lot of moving pieces involved in the migration, and we're going to be talking about you know, how each one of them work together. And the scope of this migration is kind of interesting. Uh, coming from a number of disparate sources, including WordPress sites. Specifically, there were 10 blogs that we were coming from, all hosted on WordPress VIP. Uh, that included uh, 52,000 uh, individual terms that were all in this one flat you know, monolithic taxonomy. Uh, 101,000 posts, or basically articles, uh, over 90,000 images. And then the other system uh, was uh, Vignette 6, which is content a proprietary content management system. Uh, Vignette V6 uh, dates back to 2007, and it's been kind of creaking along. And there's a reason why that they were looking for an opportunity to modernize and move off of it. Uh, so there was 117,000 uh, posts on that, uh, over 200,000 images, uh, 97,000 know, taxonomy terms uh, that were actually split off in many different uh, areas as opposed to like one uh, monolithic taxonomy, and uh, almost 5,000 photo galleries, which drive a lot of traffic to the site. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of things coming from many disparate places, all going into one monolithic Drupal 7 instance. So a little bit about the development teams. Four Kitchens, uh, when we started the engagement, you know, post the uh, post-discovery phase, started off with three developers, uh, scaled up to uh, six developers at uh, the apex, and then uh, started uh, drawing back when we were getting closer to launch. Uh, Time Incorporated started off with one dedicated developer and uh, uh, moved up to about four developers working full-time on the site. Uh, and part of the whole process was this kind of handoff or empowering them and making sure that they're acclimated to the system that was built and also building it you know, with them uh, embedded within our team. So it wasn't really kind of an us versus them kind of thing, it was we. We're all working on the same project together, all participating in the same sprints, you know, using the same issue queue, communicating with each other as if you know, we're all physically in the same organization. Uh, we used Zoom, which is a... Uh, uh, video chat client, uh, which is, uh, you know, has many advantages over a system like uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, you can support, you know, more than uh, 25 individual video streams simultaneously and we uh, use what we refer to as kind of the Brady Bunch view, uh, where you can see everybody at the same time. This really kind of humanizes the experience when uh, working with a team of developers as opposed to, say, if you're just using a uh, system like HipChat, uh, which is good for day-to-day -day communication, but uh, it depersonalizes the experience. You can't see the people behind them. So when you are participating either in a meeting or a daily stand-up, actually being able to see the developers really puts that kind of uh, you know, human touch to it. You know that these are people that you're working together with. So yeah, video chat I think is essential to the success of any type of project, especially if there's a problem. It's one thing to pick up a phone, it's another per, you know, thing to actually face a person and you know, talk out an issue or, talk, or have the meeting uh, in person. Uh, another thing that we used is GitHub Selfies, uh, which sounds a little bit silly, but like, bear with me. Uh, it's this Chrome extension that uh, allows you to uh, use your webcam to uh, basically take a picture or an animated GIF of yourself and add it to uh, GitHub comments. So uh, this is very helpful for uh, morale because, and also just, you know, kind of like, when you're, when you're doing a code review and you say, it's like, well, this is bad. It's like, people take that personally. It's like, you know, whether or not it's intellectually correct, you know, it's like you are uh, being critical of somebody's work. But if you can, like, make it a little bit more lighthearted and say, and say, you know, just say, like, ship it and actually, like, you know, give, 
<laughs> give the uh, symbol for ship it or actually draw a little boat and make it dance. You know, it's like these like 30 seconds worth of effort, like, you know, really makes it, you know, more personal. And, uh, you know, here's an example of one that was used uh, when uh, a uh, particular pull request passed code review. Uh, and it's like, all right, this is cool. So, timeline of the project. Uh, you know, this is the actual, uh, you know, GitHub uh, repository. Uh, that's how much code was committed over the uh, duration of the project. The first commit uh, started on April t uh, 29th, 2014. Uh, the launch date was uh, uh, January 29th. So, 17 sprints, two weeks each. So, we had, like, this kind of, like, regular sprint cycle in which, you know, you do the story estimation, uh, you know, to, you know, determine the team's velocity, uh, do the prioritization and so forth, make, making sure that people are tasked and also like giving you kind of a sense of like when we're going to be able to launch. So uh, across the two teams, uh, there were focuses and, some, uh, and also there was uh, also some uh, delegation responsibilities across the organizations. Four Kitchens was responsible for the project management of the uh, uh, of the uh, actual implementation of the site uh, for the data structures that were used in the architecture. Folks, come on, just uh, feel, uh, take a seat. We got a number of spaces available. Uh, we also implemented the migration uh, and uh, implemented the design and advertising. Now, implemented is not the same as actually creating the design or the advertising. We were just, uh, it's like, here are the goals, here's what it's supposed to look like and so forth. So Time Incorporated, they were obviously the product owner, they were the people who had like the most interest and also the, uh, the business context to be able to know what they needed. Uh, they provided the design in the form of comps uh, and uh, a lot of the comps, uh, we actually used a, a third party called Notable, uh, which is actually a fantastic service for uh, producing annotated screenshots. So it's like, here's the photo, uh, you know, here's a screenshot of what it's supposed to look like with individual areas highlighted. You can go to, like, say, area 17, and you get a little pop-up that will describe the functionality that is intended behind it, you know, what fields are being used or what's the, uh, what's the semantic intent of this particular piece. Uh, they are also in charge of uh, providing the editorial workflow components. Uh, we, uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, last year's DrupalCon, at the uh, there's uh, the 2014 session actually goes pretty deeply into the editorial workflow and uh, kind of some of the prototypes that were being used. We're also going to discuss it a little bit further uh, in this presentation as well. And they uh, they hosted the final product and uh, provided the. Uh, local hosting environments that uh, developers used that uh, mirrored the configuration of the production environments and uh, managed the build process, uh, which, you know, using Jenkins on the, uh, for deployments on their hosted infrastructure and using Fing to do the, uh, the actual builds of uh, the site. So uh, next up, we're going to have Preston talk about standards and documentation and the process that was used for the site. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, so what I'll be covering next is uh, sort of our approach to the process that we undertook and uh, documentation, things like coding standards. So um, in any sort of agile methodology, it's very important to uh, have a very clear definition of what done means and what ready means. Uh, what does it mean for a story to be ready uh, to begin work? What does it mean for a story to be done and marked done? So uh, at the very outset of this project, we really focused on producing a very robust definition of what these things mean. Um, in terms of a definition of readiness, um, we needed to, re you know, we required that every ticket before a developer would start on it needed to have a, uh, a very robust set of requirements, uh, acceptance criteria, so on and so forth. It needed to be uh, slotted into a sprint um, and tagged for, and, and, um, uh, and also categorized for a release as well. So um, this was very important. We approached uh, uh, all of our stakeholders and made sure that all of our tickets were, were written in a way that would allow developers to uh, work at a very high velocity without blockers. And for developers, uh, we had a very robust definition of what 
complete means. What, what does it mean when your task is actually complete? And what this involved was uh, a, very, um, a, a very organized review process that involved both a code review and a functional review um, uh, within GitHub pull requests. And we also had several product owners who were able to accept these stories during our sprint retrospectives uh, while we demoed them. Um, and finally, of course, uh, the importance of documentation for different features. If you, you know, add a new feature that wasn't there before and might require some sort of uh, you know, help uh, text or, or, a, or a readme file, those sorts of things were absolutely essential uh, for the story to be marked complete. But, you know, again, uh, uh, as with an, you know, any sort of agile uh, approach to a project, it's, uh, you know, the, we defined this framework at the beginning, but we constantly iterated on it throughout the project, and it was an, evol it, it was an evolving framework that, uh, uh, that, that worked quite well for us and, and um, uh, 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 helped us to really uh, advance our approach to process. So all of our code and style standards were algorithmically enforced. We used task runners and various uh, tools in order to provide the robustness of code that we required from all of our developers. Uh, the first was PHP Code Sniffer, which is uh, a package with the Drupal coder module. Um, and we required that any PHP that was written would need to uh, be run through PHP Code Sniffer in order to detect any potential syntax errors or, or uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we also used JS Hint to a great extent, which uh, uh, gave us a very good uh, 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 look into syntax errors in JavaScript um, and ensured that all of our JavaScript would run appropriately. Uh, and finally, we used JSCS um, for code style, uh, enforcing things such as two space indents, which is part of the Drupal coding standards, uh, enforcing things like um, uh, 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 making sure that there's spaces after anonymous functions, so on and so forth. Um, and finally, in order to ensure parity between our various IDEs, given that we have such a, a distributed team and many different approaches to development, we really wanted to make sure that uh, you know, things like tabs and spaces and, and, and so on and so forth were matched across all of the IDEs that we were using. Uh, in terms of our commit and pull request workflow, uh, again, we leveraged GitHub for our repository. And um, one of the things that we really focused on and honed in on at the beginning of the project was to ensure that all developers produced action-based descriptive commit messages that were very clear. Um, and that would allow us to very easily cherry pick or cherry pit whatever commits we needed by solely looking at the message itself and not looking at the diff. Um, we also uh, required that uh, all developers provided on every opened pull request a very strong set of testing instructions, which would allow anyone to basically complete the test. Um, and this is very useful when you are very siloed into different tasks. And for example, John would be working on a migration. I would be working on some very front end tasks. And he would ask me to test a migration. And then, well, I haven't touched migration. What are, you, are you kidding me, John? But John would provide a very, very clear list of steps for me to test. And this facilitated a very easy process. And what actually happened is that we actually had a lot of cross-pollination where we learned a lot about each other's code by using this method. Uh, and finally, we also had a pull request labeling scheme uh, provided by Matt uh, uh, in order to you know, have color coding and uh, uh, make it very clear what stage of the review process each of our pull requests were at. In terms of code review, uh, we asked several questions of developers whenever they completed a task. Uh, the first is, does it pass code and style standards? Uh, you know, did you run uh, Gulp? Did you run PHP Code Sniffer? Uh, 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 you know, these are things that are very important to uh, instill at the very beginning of a project. Next, does it accomplish the task gracefully? Um, is this the best solution for this problem? Is this the best approach to this problem? Um, and finally, does it perform at an optimal level, both from the back end and the front end perspective? Uh, performance was a very important consideration for us throughout this entire project. Uh, in terms of our functional reviews, we, you know, again, we also tested our functionality of each of the different features that we implemented. Um, and some of the questions that we answered were, well, uh, does it fulfill the intent of the story? You know, if the story is asking you to make all of your hyperlinks blue, it's not asking you to put an animated monkey gif after every link. It's asking you to put, you know, to actually limit that to uh, uh, the, the, the blue color of the, of the link itself. And so uh, ensuring that scope was respected was uh, a very important portion of the functional review process. Uh, does it use best practices? And this goes back to the graceful solution uh, idea. You know, is this, is this something that uh, was written well? Is this something that, uh, uh, you know, other developers can point to and say that this was something that, that, that you know, would have been written the same way had somebody else done it? 
And finally, does it avoid technical debt? Uh, we really wanted to avoid a situation in which, you know, after launch, we would have to spend two or three or four sprints really sort of cleaning up the project. Um, and, and, and so all of our pull requests and all of our, 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 our tickets uh, were, uh, uh, you know, had a lot of scrutiny on this notion of, of, of ensuring that we wouldn't need to do a whole lot of sort of cleanup development uh, after the fact. In terms of our development environments, we used uh, uh, we uh, leveraged um, a virtual machine provided uh, by our Time Inc. Uh, infrastructure team, and um, uh, we actually provided a great deal of documentation that was project specific and allowed uh, many of our developers to become onboarded at a very fast clip. Um, at, at the beginning of the project, it would take about a couple of days, two or three days, for developers to be onboarded, just because the, the documentation was in a very sort of fluctuating state. Um, by the end of the project, it was reduced to a matter of you know, hours or a half day, um, and, and, and this was really greatly aided by our focus on documentation. Uh, we also had weekly meetings with the infrastructure team and, and the virtual machine team at uh, uh, Time Inc. Uh, and uh, uh, provided very detailed feedback about sort of uh, uh, you know, some, of the, some of the ways to improve or advance the, the, the virtualization. In terms of our branching standard, uh, uh, so, so this is a very, uh, 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 very you know, sort of oft discussed topic in uh, 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 in, um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in as far as branching goes. So, uh, in order to uh, provide a very robust branching standard, we uh, actually used um, sprint-based. Uh, branch names. And what this means is that we would use a sprint prefix and then the number of the sprint. And what this did is it really reduced the amount of clutter that we had and made our code base a lot more navigable. Um, it, it really improved communication because it was very immediately clear what ticket your branch was reflecting, what was the uh, sprint that that branch is going to go into. Uh, and so we also had project prefix and then the ticket number afterwards. And what this did is it really ensured that we kept all of our branches at the same, uh, very synchronized with our, with our, uh, with our ticketing system. Uh, every time you merge in a pull request, you would uh, delete the sprint branch, or sorry, you would delete the uh, uh, particular feature branch, and then once the sprint completed, you would uh, actually tag um, those sprints. And what this did is it allowed us to really target different uh, 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 points in our, in our code base um, so that we could, you know, for example, uh, present to stakeholders a very particular uh, state of the code. And now Matt is going to talk about our front end. Hello. Talk about theming, performance, and advertising. So, uh, we use Aurora uh, as a base theme for the site, and we built the mobile theme first. Uh, in this project, separate themes was a hard requirement uh, from the business, so we used a edge server to detect the actual device that the client or the customer was using, and set a cookie uh, on that incoming request. Uh, we used the theme key module to switch the uh, template, right? Uh, so again, Aurora's base theme. Uh, here we go. We just took advantage of HTML5, SAS, and Compass, uh, like most people. Uh, so then, again, the mobile theme is a sub-theme of Aurora, and the desktop is a sub-theme of the mobile theme. And this enabled us to share a bunch of resources that we developed for the mobile theme up to the desktop theme, so we don't have to repeat ourselves or do anything more than once. Uh, so well, we use Gulp. Uh, as our task manager, uh, it's great, it's really fast, uh, you guys should be using it. Uh, this compiles, <laughs> uh, we use Gulp to compile our SAS uh, and also run the JavaScript checkers, the JS lint and JS CS that Preston mentioned earlier. Uh, this also watched for changes in our build system, so you don't have to restart or recompile our SAS, make sure you got everything. Um, so. Again, one of the biggest things we built was this JavaScript global like management system. Uh, there's a lot of pieces on the site, and we wanted to keep everything from polluting the global scope. Uh, so there is one global J uh, JS object for Entertainment Weekly that contains uh, metadata and all the functions attached. Uh, this gives us a centralized point of entry. Uh, we can talk, get anything about the page from this one object. Uh, you don't have to know about anything else, uh, and there's not. Uh, confusion of about where something might live. So it's easy access. Uh, so, and non-radioactive functionality. Uh, <laughs> uh, so basically, with that global object, each uh, page 
got everything was broken out into different files, right? We only want to load the things that are needed. Uh, this is very important uh, on a site that has a lot of JavaScript. Uh, you want to keep it as slim as possible. So, I mean, we're using aggregation, but things were conditionally aggregated together only when they were needed. Uh, and this drastically improves the front end performance of the site. So, pre processing, uh, you know, we are basically taking uh, no template, uh, no template data is built into pre processing. Uh, everything is super clean and reusable. Uh, so, this enabled us to have some series of functions uh, that helped uh, build data and expose it to the template layer uh, in something that's very clean and reusable so that we can build templates faster and in a standardized manner. Uh, helpers and abstraction functions that were built that allowed to take sort of complex actions, uh, get things out of the database uh, in a sane manner. Um, so yeah, another really big piece we built was this global metadata object. This uh, took, uh, it's attached to that global EW object I mentioned earlier. This uh, is all the metadata about an individual page and it's attached in one location. It's available in one location, in one scope. Uh, this avoids repetition. Uh, every time you build a feature, it doesn't always need to have metadata rebuilt for each individual feature. Uh, this also facilitated a really great access by like crawlers, uh, one place to look for something about a page. Uh, that was very important. Uh, so beacon performance, yikes, please don't look at the mouse. I don't know how to use the computer. So beacon performance is another thing. Uh, things like tracking uh, and additional like advertisers. Uh, we wanted to delay these as late as possible on the page, sort of content first, right? So we used the defer objects uh, on JavaScript. Uh, and this put everything sort of load blast, right? Get the content first to the client and then, you know, load any additional interactions after that. So Great, this is the best part. Uh, so ad performance, right? Uh, as you know, ads are potentially slow and ads can make your site really slow and so we wanted to really improve this aspect of the site. Um, so in the template, traditionally, you would do uh, inline JavaScript, right, for rendering your ad. We got rid of that whole entire concept. Uh, so there's no ad specific logic in your templates now. Um, the only thing that's contained are a bunch of data attrib tags attached to the div that's in the page. This uh, provides uh, starting information for the ad that's rendered, uh, avoids inline JS, and ads are then picked up after the page is fully done and in the footer there's sort of a, some logic to figure out where the ads are, read those data attribs, and then add the ads after the page is loaded. Uh, and this enabled us to render the ads last but still provide ads rendering before they were previously and this is a huge win uh, for us. So uh, Preston's going to talk about the editor UI and workflow. Thanks, Matt. So uh, I'm going to introduce you guys to a little bit of timing jargon right now. So packages and channels are basically glorified aggregate views. Um, they were two content types that we leveraged a great deal of uh, in our project. And basically, the, the, one of the hard business requirements that we had uh, through developing this project was the opportunity for editors to provide automatic dynamic content. Well, what that means is that editors would define rules for what sort of content would be selected by a query and inserted into these packages and channels, these aggregate views. But uh, we also needed to ensure that certain things could be manually curated as well. So if you wanted to have, let's say, one story at the top uh, that was specific, you could also, uh, and, then, and then also have backfill that would uh, uh, populate the rest of the view. So uh, initially what we did is we, uh, 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 we used Time Inc. Uh, uh, features um, in order to uh, provision our content types and we actually ended up extending these uh, featureized content types to a great extent. Um, and uh, they underwent a very robust series of uh, uh, product owner and editorial feedback. Um, and one of the uh, big keys to uh, ensuring uh, adoption across the editorial group was uh, usability. Um, and so we wanted to make sure in these rounds of feedback and these rounds of reviews that editors were actually finding that, uh, uh, their, that the step-by-step -step process, whatever they were doing in the node creation process, was actually easy to use. So what we did is um, we, uh, uh, our team member Patrick Coffey uh, put together a custom module uh, uh, that produced dynamic entity references which allowed us to put in entity reference fields that would provide these aggregate views that editors wanted. Um, and so what would happen is that you would go into the node creation page uh, and you would have uh, complete editorial control of these views um, but you could also provide overrides. Um, 
And this is a custom module that would actually backfill um, the empty parts of a view based on its context. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were rules for selection, and you could also have manual, cu manual curation, but the backfill process would actually be automatic. So, for, you know, for instance, uh, you know, if you have a view that lists 15 articles or 15 nodes, uh, the editor could define five of those nodes that would appear um, uh, in those first five positions. The dynamic edit reference module would populate the remaining. So here were some of the challenges that we faced when we implemented this solution. Um, uh, you know, as, as you might have noticed, we decided not to use views, um, and, and that was because of some uh, uh, concerns that we had and some of the, 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 the major attention that we uh, focused in terms of performance. Uh, so the challenges that we faced were really making it very extensible and reusable because this is a, this is a, this is a system that was used in many different places across the website. Um, and also, we wanted to make sure that any of these nodes that were uh, that, that were dynamically curated would actually be accurate and wouldn't actually select the the wrong nodes. Um, and also, another challenge that that we really grappled with, and, and well, mostly Patrick grappled with, was uh, a performance and uh, uh, ensuring that this feature performed at the level that we wanted. Uh, the other uh, uh, major concern that we had was just editorial expectations for caching. We uh, really wanted to ensure that high-velocity publishing by editors would be uh, 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 facilitated by uh, uh, this process, and um, that was one of the, 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 the major concerns that we uh, addressed during this process. And finally, uh, uh, Time Inc. We uh, we are uh, uh, we chose to use a workflow system known as State Machine, and, and integrating with that uh, particular system was a real challenge as well. And now, John, uh, we'll talk about our content migrations. Thanks, Preston. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we came from a number of disparate systems, WordPress and Vignette, and we're all consolidating it into one place, Drupal. So WordPress is its own little bundle of wax. So digging into it, you have 10 different blogs. Uh, each one of those uh, was spun up by a different, you know, different team. Some of them were literally clones of each other, used as the same kind of starting place. Others were set up from the, uh, started from the ground up. Uh, each one of those had uh, different uh, structures, so some of them were just like a complete uh, stock WordPress installation with just a, you know, a different look and feel of them. Some of them actually had some custom content types in it. And also um, trying to combine all these disparate taxonomies into one, you know, in into one repository. Uh, also, uh, whenever you have humans working on a system, you find mistakes. Also, people write uh, imperfect code, especially with what you see is what you get kind of editors. So there's an invalid markup that we're trying to clean and, and prevent uh, uh, problems in the future. Uh, also, uh, each one of these sites had their own set of custom short codes and filters. So in addition to all the WordPress short codes and filters that, uh, that are provided, there was a superset of like you know, time incorporated uh, specific brand functionality. So um, it's like, well, why don't you just use WordPress Migrate? WordPress Migrate is a fantastic module if you're going from like just a plain Jane uh, WordPress site to a plain Jane uh, you know, Drupal site. Uh, with no content types, it's like this is an article, this is an article, this is a comment, this is comment. Now kith, you know, it's not. Uh, the problem is that as soon as you start getting into custom content types or like fields or like trying to use logic as part of the migration, uh, it it doesn't work out of the box. Now, when we were working on this project, this is back in uh, 2014. Uh, WordPress uh, migrate 2.6 was. Uh, we weren't. The latest version wasn't available yet. It was still in beta, so we were uh, stuck on Migrate 2.5. And uh, it provided us a framework that uh, allowed us to actually create a custom migration by extending the classes that are available within WordPress Migrate and uh, building your own custom migration classes on top of that. Uh, WordPress Migrate is also fantastic for normalizing the WXR uh, the, their proprietary WXR structure, which is, if you look at it, is just kind of like a wacky XML fee, feed uh, that is generated by their RSS system. And uh, by using WordPress Migrate as like a starting point, it really kind of accelerated uh, development and allowed us to focus on the custom logic that was required to make you know, all these pieces work. And I just won't move to the wrong place. So 
how did we handle this? Uh, WordPress, my, uh, we, we did a lot of pre-processing on the content even before we started the migration itself. So uh, we stripped the comments out. So one of the, uh, one of the things that had uh, taken place uh, across the lifespan of these WordPress blogs is there was a transition of the commenting system from uh, WordPress's built-in commenting system, which you know had a lot of spam and had a lot of problems, moved it over to Discuss, which is you know asynchronous. You can uh, basically delegate the responsibility for the commenting system and the single sign-on and so forth to another system. So. Uh, but WordPress doesn't really care. It's like, here's this export that has all this garbage that you don't really uh, care. And also with like invalid content and some actually malicious content. So it's like, we wanted to get rid of that. So uh, stripped out the comments. Uh, also transforming identifiers. Uh, so when you have uh, multiple sites that you're migrating from into the same system that uh, either are clones from each other or it doesn't matter. You're starting, uh, everybody starts from one. And so everybody has a uh, post ID one. It, uh, migrate will look at that and say, oh, I've already imported post one. I'm not gonna do it again. So what we had to do is uh, basically read all the files, transform the identifiers, basically prepended them with the name of the blog uh, that it was coming from and you know, to make them unique. So you had one that was uh, style watch. Uh, you had another one, uh, Stylewatch ID one, and you had another one that was Ken Tucker's TV ID one, and so forth. So, you know, that way, uh, Migrate would be able to differentiate where each of these pieces of content came from and had the context necessary to be able to combine them into one monolithic system. Uh, we uh, separated out the authors, uh, which is uh, kind of repetitive information uh, within the uh, WXR imports. Uh, separated out the images themselves uh, into uh, a separate JSON file, so it was, uh, so you didn't have to uh, traverse literally gigabytes of uh, XML content. It's like, oh, you know, here's a, a few megs of uh, just cleanly structured JSON content, and also uh, move tags onto their uh, uh, into their own files as well. So WordPress uh, has its uh, built-in shortcode system and filters, uh, which work really, really well. They also want you to continue using WordPress. WordPress Vi VIP makes it very easy for you to get this dump, but it will leave all the shortcodes in place. It won't render them, which is useful, but it isn't. Uh, because Drupal doesn't render WordPress shortcodes. There is a shortcode module. Uh, back in 2014, it wasn't that robust. Now in 2015, it's actually a little bit better. It's uh, worth taking a look at now. Uh, but uh, what made sense for the context of the migration was to take uh, kind of like a subset of these uh, short codes, actually implement them in Drupal, but like render the rest of them as part of the migration uh, process because you know here's like this old uh, old or deprecated functionality it made sense once you know but it, last time in this short code was used just three four years ago no sense taking developer time to re-implement it in Drupal if you're never going to use it again so just render it as you know straight HTML uh, so uh, most of the short codes and filters weren't migrated uh, and so what did we do we rendered them as HTML and pre-processing how did we do that well who knows best how to render WordPress than WordPress? So I uh, actually took uh, the, uh, the WordPress uh, right source code, uh, kind of like separated out, created this kind of like mini WordPress pretending to uh, bootstrap uh, kind of installation and actually using WordPress native functions and the, the actual you know, short codes and filters uh, that can't come with WordPress and the custom stuff and uh, you know, fake the bootstrap so it would not actually execute in the database, but it would uh, work well enough to be able to execute the code natively. This happened really, really quickly, again, without actually having to bootstrap. It's like, hey, is there a caching class? Return null. Yes, there is. Good job. Move on. It's, uh, and that greatly decreased the complexity of the, you know, uh, of the process rather than having to implement, say, I think it was uh, between 150 and 200 short codes. Rather than doing that, we only focused on about a dozen. I keep pressing the wrong button. So, uh, also, one of the problems that you have when you have uh, all this disparate content is uh, normalization of the data across all these places. People have fat fingers. People make mistakes, misspell things. Uh, there is a, you know, uh, actually one of the tags that I remember uh, specifically, it was cool to use YOLO once. They decided, 
they didn't editorially they didn't want to use YOLO anymore. So you know, how are you going to be able to you know take care of like renaming tags, combining them, uh, using logic, also uh, by uh, separating them out into distinct vocabularies. So you have something like Miley Cyrus, that's a person. Uh, and there's a person content type. How do you map it to that? Uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, make a program that has all that logic, but editors, humans, have that knowledge. So how do we translate that knowledge into something that is actionable? So what we did is uh, created this uh, CSV spreadsheet. It's like, okay, here are all the available terms. Here's the context where it came from. Here's the blog that it came from. Uh, and here's a, a series of columns. So it's like, you know, there's a column for, you know, is this a creative work, you know, such as a movie or a book? Is this a person? Is this something that should be renamed? Is this something that should be ignored, like YOLO? And uh, we, we, we took those rules and uh, uh, on import basically just... Uh, it loaded a term. If that term is found in the spreadsheet, use it, use whatever rules uh, are applied by that. Uh, editors were happy because they didn't have to do anything that was programmatic. They could just use Excel or uh, OpenOffice to edit the sheet. And then we just took the CSV, just threw it in the code base, imported it, and uh, away we went. Vignette is uh, also uh, one of those systems that, you know, it's like they're not going to make it easy for you to get out. So the uh, TI infrastructure team actually had to write their own exporter for it uh, and uh, used XML once again uh, for the structures. Uh, now, most of the content was uh, rendered as HTML. Uh, again, similar to WordPress, there was a, uh, the... Uh, they had a system called prox, uh, which are basically like short codes. It has the same functional equivalents. Uh, the short code module that I mentioned before didn't handle those uh, that syntax uh, in the same way. Uh, it didn't have like an open and close tag. It was just in one place. So we implemented our own short code system. Again, we uh, you know, rendered a number of the tags. Uh, you know, things like uh, there was a BR tag and a bold tag. It's like, okay, just render that as HTML. Uh, but for something that has more specific functionality, uh, such as embedding an image that will uh, link to a particular celebrity and so forth, uh, that's something that makes sense to actually implement that as a short code. Um, <clears throat> we also um, you know, took some of those taxonomy terms that uh, were contained in vignette that had like this very specific structure and actually uh, transformed it into content, took the, kind of the metadata that was associated with it. So something that was a movie, for example, uh, was used as a taxonomy term. It's like, okay, this is now a node that has, you know, a duration, a length, you know, here's the actors who are in it, here's the MPA rating, and so forth. So migration performance, especially when you're dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of objects, uh, is really important because you want the migrations to go as quickly as possible. You want to iterate uh, often. You want to also minimize the amount of downtime or the need for double publishing. Uh, when actually making the, uh, making the switch over. So there's a number of things that we did to improve uh, performance. Validate what you're ingesting. Uh, uh, PHP's native XML functions bog down uh, as soon as they uh, hit any type of error state. Similar to you know, PHP warnings and errors, uh, if there's a problem, it slows down to an absolute crawl. So uh, we used XML lint. Uh, you know, up front and, uh, and basically worked with the infrastructure team. And any time that there was any kind of syntax error, it's like, go back, fix it, you know, let's normalize it. With the WXR files, uh, yeah, guess what? WordPress is going to actually um, give you some unclean XML, which is kind of a pain in the butt. So uh, there was a, a list of like five files that actually required hand editing because of that, uh, of invalid markup. Uh, also, in, uh, eliminating all PHP warnings uh, and errors, uh, no matter what the level is, as soon as PHP uh, hits an error of any sort, it puts it into a kind of a recovery state. Even if that message is not printed to the screen, it still slows it down. It's still gathering information and logging it internally. Uh, also, avoiding redundant uh, migrations. I mentioned, uh, you know, separating out the images into their own file, separating out the authors, and, and so forth. And again, so you don't have to traverse the same data over and over again, uh, and also uh, making things as granular as possible. It's like, okay, so you have uh, 
you know, for example, it's like all the articles are in this one file. We'll, we'll uh, separate all these uh, content types into their own file. So, you, um, so again, you don't have to traverse the gigabytes of data. Uh, also, uh, migrate out of the box does not cache counts. Uh, if you're uh, loading, uh, say, a thousand items, it doesn't really matter. When you're loading uh, 500,000 items, this makes a huge difference. Uh, which would you rather? You know, five seconds to get a response or 15 minutes every time. Uh, it's uh, kind of a no-brainer, but it's not on by default because uh, it, you know, it takes time and, uh, to actually compute that. Uh, also, we did our best to uh, reduce the migration uh, overhead. WordPress, uh, or, I'm sorry, the migrate module version 2.6, I think, and above. Uh, I know definitely it's in 2.7. Uh, you know, gives you the ability to uh, selectively disable hooks. Migrate 2.5 did not, so uh, we disabled uh, the, like the solar integration, you know, for the search backend, path auto, meta tag, and a number of others. During the migration, it's like, okay, you know, we'll get everything in there, turn those back on, run cron, uh, do, you know, and basically get things caught up because there's no reason to do all those operations uh, like indexing, for example, on each individual piece of content. Just do it in a batch at the end. Uh, also, indexing uh, lookup tables. So when you have legacy content uh, and you want to do associations, you need to have, you know, you need to know where that content came from. And uh, so you can add it as a field. It's like, great, I've added the legacy identifier to the field. Those aren't indexed. You have to actually go through, you know, manually put an index for it. So when you do a lookup, even if it is just an integer, uh, it, uh, it's going to still be slow until you add an index to it. Uh, also, uh, we scripted out a system that would allow uh, some of the migrations to run in parallel, so we could run them literally simultaneously on the same system. So you're running WordPress migrations and the uh, vignette migrations at the same time. Uh, and something that is uh, always an you know, interesting kind of concern uh, when you're uh, getting ready for launch, making sure that there's a sufficient hardware resources that are going to be available to do the processing. Because this is you know, a very intensive data-driven operation. Uh, it's a different kind of load, but it is still a very high load. So if you... Uh, you know, if you're trying to get everything into a tiny funnel, it's like, oh, no, there's no production data, or there, there's no production traffic right now. We're only going to give you one server. You're going to kind of have a bad time. You want to be able to run those things on a, as robust resources as possible, especially like a database is a, you know, a prime example. It's like you want to make sure that uh, it's on a beefy machine as you're working. Uh, the redirection strategy, uh, obviously, when you're working, uh, when you have a lot of... Uh, Content, you want to ensure that uh, you, know, you don't lose any SEO in the transition, so you want to make sure that there's uh, you know, proper redirect strategy in place and making sure that links to old content still are able to get to the new content location. So Drupal is, you know, can perform redirects. It sucks at it. It's really slow. Um, you want to be able to handle that on the edge. Um, so uh, Time Incorporated has a redirect form. Uh, you know they're using Akamai and they're using some other layers. You know in there that you can use basically pattern-based. Uh, you know redirects. You can also do one-to-one -one redirects on a particular URL. Um, DNS changes obviously is like hey the, uh, if you go to the old uh, WordPress blog location since uh, they they manage the DNS that they're just like nope that's now pointing to EW. Uh, redirects from the migrated servers themselves. I mean, just write, uh, you know, for example, Apache, you just you know, say, well, guess what? Everything goes over to this other domain. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that got the vast majority of it. Uh, so the last piece is going to be uh, performance and caching. And this is from Matt. Hello. So front end performance. Uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, we'll go a little bit deeper now. So uh, CSS uh, is SAS and Compass optimized. Uh, I'm sure you know this. <laughs> so basically, we really wanted to limit the CSS that was loaded when we were building the site. Right? Don't send down your entire set of styles if you don't need them. So again, JavaScript is linted to very strict standards. Uh, we wanted to reduce the probability that you get an error. Uh, if you get an error, then the whole rest of this thing is blocked, and you're going to have a bad day. So uh, again, Chase is in the footer. Uh, we put this as the last thing that's going to execute. Uh, we don't want to get to the situation where you're blocking the rendering of your content with JavaScript, and if there's an error, then your whole page is busted. So front-end caching strategy, uh, 
basically we had an editorial one minute published to live goal. Uh, we really uh, work to ensure that cacheable headers are sent uh, for each request, uh, and we set a shorter TTL on Akamai than on Varnish. This gave us a nice uh, ability to keep content fresh. So, and when we were publishing content, we were sending purges, uh, and this allowed us to keep things in cache uh, more persistently uh, and then clear them when they're updated so we're not automatically expiring things and generating uh, a more predictable load. So again, back in performance, uh, again, like John said, eliminate all these PHP errors. Uh, we did our best to eliminate everything. Uh, and then for our custom queries, uh, we're caching everything as much as possible and making sure those details are set accurately uh, and explaining custom queries, figuring out you know what might be slow, what we can optimize, and, and minimizing unnecessary overhead. Don't do things you don't need to do. Uh, be cautious, uh, don't add a rocket ship when you just want to make a link blue, like Preston said. So, and we reduce the module count, right? Don't, um, just take a look at this. Uh, you might be familiar with site audit module, this will help you out with this. Uh, so, benchmarking, again, we tried to analyze everything we were doing to make sure that it was actually the right thing. Uh, so, again, for performance testing, uh, we really, we load tested once we got the uh, production data in. This was a big deal for us because the site did actually behave differently once this happened, uh, and so we learned a lot. So uh, we used blitz.io uh, and some custom tooling uh, to make sure we were able to provide an accurate, uh, replayable load test. Uh, and that's a really big deal, is something that you can, uh, load test that you can repeat over and over again and make a change and run it again and get some like standard benchmarks uh, so uh, we definitely use New Relic for introspection on the server side. Uh, this is very valuable, uh, especially running right up to launch, we found a really uh, slow thing that we didn't think was going to be slow and then it turned out to be terrible uh, and we were able to fix it uh, thanks to New Relic. So, and we exercised uh, different content types uh, that exceeded the TTLs. So let's say you have an article and it has a TTL of five minutes and we're going to sustain a constant load for six minutes. What happens when that node has to be regenerated? Uh, we wanted to figure that out. Uh, and we were able to do that. So uh, we use webpagetest.org. Uh, it's pretty standard for front end performance. Uh, film strip view and the HARs you can get, uh, which can be replayed in Chrome. This gave us uh, really great insight into things that were loading and third party resources that were taking a really long time to load and blocking our site. And we were able to work with our vendors to get that faster. So great. It's the end of the session. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, So thank, thank you very much. There's a microphone in the middle of the room. Uh, do you folks have any questions? Oh, there's a switch there. Should just be like a little. I mean, I don't know how microphones work. We shout it out. I'll re I'll repeat the question. This is uh, actually a lot of it relates to advertising, right? And how ads are sold right now, uh, and ad placements and ad sizes uh, between desktop and mobile themes. Uh, and so, and the technology honestly isn't really super there yet for responsive ads. Uh, and so, we wanted to build a system that allowed like two very different displays uh, for the content and then the advertising. So, and it, I mean, it's, it was a requirement from the business in the end. So. I thought you were
were going to ask a migrate question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We were definitely uh, using the RDFA and uh, uh, to add additional metadata attached to the module for or attached to the article for uh, like Google search results uh, and additional like includes. So. Uh, which modules would we use for that? Uh, definitely use the metadata. Yeah. Metadata. Um, I can look it up. Uh, if find me after this, I can tell you exactly what we used to get that done. So. Great, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, when you say backend, uh, the question is uh, how are we syncing backend changes? Can you clarify a little bit? Oh, okay. Uh, so we use features uh, across the site, and also, uh, in addition, used uh, the master module uh, to be able to uh, enable and disable uh, modules across uh, different t uh, environmental tiers. So you have dev, test, and live, and you also have a local environment. So uh, <clears throat> yeah. So we feature fe featureize the content. Um, from the development perspective, uh, we basically had a running database that was used um, and regenerated once per sprint, uh, you know, basically doing like this bare metal approach. But over the course of the sprint, we were trying to treat it similar to a production environment where you don't have the option to, you know, reformat and redo everything every, uh, you know, every release. So, um, you know, part of the testing process is, okay, you know, take, uh, take the, uh, the database snapshot that was created at the uh, beginning of the sprint um, that has the configuration up to that point, uh, you know, run, you know, run whatever the deployment process is, if it's features, uh, if it's the master module, make sure that everything is enabled, make sure the structural changes, you know, take place and, uh, you know, and also this uh, prevented like, you know, weird kind of re regression errors because field is, uh, I'm sorry, features is fantastic at adding things, but it won't remove them. So you got to do hook update and remember to do, yeah, you know, remember to do that. So that enforced kind of like developer best practices and it's like, hey, this is the real world kind of expectation that you're going to have once the site's going to live. So uh, you don't have that kind of like developer, oh, well, it worked locally, but, you know, I don't know what the heck's going on in production. <laughs> uh, not, not, in, not internally. Well, uh, well, you know, certainly the uh, core team was very familiar with features, and uh, you know, over the course of the project, we added some developers who were a little less familiar with Drupal, and obviously there was some sort of training that we had to do and a sort of mentoring that we had to do with that. So, yeah. Oh, one thing, one other thing that I uh, didn't mention: we created a subset of content to be migrated, uh, and so if you wanted to set up a system that was had all the features reverted and had everything enabled, and you wanted to have some sample data to test with, we had a sort of a slice that was a good representation of all the content that was going to be migrated, but not the entire full set. Thank you. Um, nice. You mentioned in one of the earlier slides that you had a lot of site syncing and uh, the same standard test. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a manual step, um, and some of it was uh, we didn't have direct control over the build process. We could only, you know, influence, but we weren't you know, actually in control of it. So it's like, so instead, you know, it's like we made it as simple as possible. So there was actually a gulp task that would just, you know, run all the linting. Uh, there was an, uh, there was another one that would run, uh, you know, PHP code sniffer either on the entire project or just on a particular module that you were working on. So uh, we wanted, you know, whenever you uh, provide tools, you know, to developers and you just like use this to enforce the standards, you want to make it as easy as possible to use. So yeah, pre-commit makes absolute sense. Um, we weren't in a position to be able to do that, so we did the next best thing, which is to empower the developers with easy to use tools. It's like just run gulp php cs and, uh, uh, and it'll uh, do, the, it'll run the coding standard uh, checks over the entire PHP code base. Um, for the most part, uh, uh, I can speak more specifically to, uh, towards like the, the run-up to the actual release. 
uh, the code that was put in there uh, up to release, you know, was you know clean as possible. There was a couple last second you know fixes. Uh, once it got past the initial uh, you know, initial sprint, uh, I can't speak to that. Uh, but I, you know, Preston has been, you know, championing, uh, you know, both best practices and ensuring any, you know, developers who are, you know, both uh, supporting the site and continuing to add new functionality still adhere to the same kind of coding standards, have the same, you know, tool set and knowledge, you know, available. Uh, we focused, again, uh, a lot of effort on documentation and process and just making sure it's like, hey, there's like this one place that you can go that you can learn how to work on this project, you know, where things are, what the expectations are. Uh, you know, it takes maybe 15 minutes to read. It's not, you know, not monolithic, but it just kind of sets the expectations. And also the poll review process has been, uh, you know, that, uh, that has been maintained uh, by, you know, time and, uh, you know, is being used on other projects uh, today. Uh, we did not use panels on the project, and a very logical question is why, and uh, the short answer was uh, it was not approved. Um, there's been, uh, that decision has since been uh, changed, but by the time that change had been made, we had had a different process in place. Uh, other brands uh, and other projects that are going now are using panels and are using views. Uh, you talked about the redirects you had to implement and moving them out of the Drupal layer for performance reasons. Is there any reason why you didn't migrate the content to the legacy URLs and leave it in the same place so that the redirect layer wasn't even needed? Um, yeah, that's a that's actually a really interesting question. Uh, the particular reason uh, we were uh, a lot of the content was coming out of Vignette, which had some really really ug ugly URLs, and so the idea on that particular project was to uh, move it to you know basically clean URL structure slash article slash year month day and so forth with you know with a logical name. Um, you know, this did have some SEO uh, implications. It did increase the com you know complexity of the redirects. Um, other migrations that have taken place have taken a slightly different strategy, uh, and uh, you know, for just the reasons that you've uh, you know implied. Yeah, you know, especially when you're dealing with a compressed. Uh, we we had we had some kind of the luxury of well time not to overuse a word uh, on uh, on EW on other brand implementations. I uh, don't necessarily you know you have an accelerated timeline. It's like let's focus on an MVP. The MVP didn't include uh, maintaining those. Uh, didn't include a new URL structure, so it was been maintained one to one. So the TLDR is both approaches uh, were used <laughs> in, di in different situations for exactly the reason you identified. Uh, we're going to have time for one more question, I'm, uh, unless it's really really quick, man. I'm. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how you built your uh, JSON feed for images? Um, it, it's actually really simple. It was just iterated over the content, built a giant array, and dumped it uh, using JSON and code to a uh, flat file. Okay, <laughs> that was it, sorry. Uh, yeah, actually, we got time for one more. Quickly, uh, we'll be right back. Uh, well, could you elaborate on? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. All right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, images came from you know just, uh, a number of different sources. Uh, some of them were embedded using uh, you know inline uh, image tags. Some of them were uh, embedded using short codes and procs. And uh, so uh, we took a you know kind of a nuanced approach uh, for you know things that were in short codes. It was actually really easy for us to. Uh, uh, Add the add the logic in Drupal to look up, uh, you know, basically scan the content uh, for that legacy URL. If that legacy URL is actually attached to a imported piece of content, rewrite that, you know, to be uh, the new canonical location and uh, apply the uh, uh, image styles to it. Um, we can. I, uh, this is kind of the end of the time, but uh, come up and we can definitely. Uh, I'll give you some more context. Thank you all very much for coming. I definitely appreciate it.
I don't know. Less direct control over, 